Thank you for coming this morning. Um, the talk that I'm delivering is called Outtake, but I, I might as well have called it Takeout. I'm, I'm sorry that I've, I've managed to try to squeeze in a lot of things into a very short talk. Um, but I want to just say a couple things about Dennis Adams in case some of you don't know who he is. Um, he's a performance artist who really does interventions. He's a very political artist, and he's worked on the metamorphosis of Patricia Hearst to the trial of Klaus Barbie, to the distortions of Joseph McCarthy and the execution of the Rosenbergs. He singled out controversial figures and events um, and really trying to sort of look at buried political events and recuperating them, but in a very different sense. His, his work is site-specific and um, it's shown in, in public spaces, but also in like bus shelters. And it really deals with the politics of silencing. All right, so I'm gonna to try to just talk about three things and it'll be very uh, brief. One is how can we own an image? The second is really uh, a rethinking of appropriation art and I'm really gonna talk more about Sherry Levine and um, Jeff Koons than uh, Dennis Adams and then return to Dennis Adams and really talk about political amnesia. And I'd like to start with a quote from uh, Gilles Deleuze's Difference in Repetition where he defines repetition as a transgressive act. For Deleuze, there is something radical and differently different about repetition that cannot be confused with representation, or as he calls it, generality, the means by which we recognize similarities when we make analogies and derive equalities. He writes, quote, generality presents two major orders, the qualitative order of resemblances and the quantitative order of equivalences. But in any case, generality expresses a point of view according to which one term may be exchanged or substituted for another. If exchange is the criterion of generality, theft and gift are those of repetition. There is therefore an economic difference between the two. To repeat is to behave in a certain manner, but in relation to something unique or singular, which has no equal or equivalent." End quote. Following Gabriel Tard, Deleuze argues that repetition, or in Tard's sense, imitation, is a dark precursor, the differentiator of difference. This also recalls Tard's double construction that repetition is both the process by which difference goes on differing and its own goal. I want to think about repetition as an act of volition, theft and gift, and at the same time, an automatic process the act of differing with a goal of repetition. Despite the long and important history of appropriation in modern art, the practices of citing, copying, and repeating have reignited intense theoretical debates that reconsider the direct connections between contemporary music, film, video, the culture of the copy, and how we conceptualize notions of artistic and creative input. I only have time really to, to sketch out such relations. Through an analysis of Dennis Adams' outtake, and I'll, I'll show you a clip, a very short one in a minute, I would like to question the relation of originality and creative processes to the construction of artistic value and explore a set of relations between art, the history, the cultural context, spectatorship, and curatorship. These relations have once again become politicized in the critique of the art industry as well as the culture of the gallery and the cult of innovation. Outtake is both a theft and a gift, an assemblage work that draws together concepts, produces its own handiwork, and elicits reactions that interrupt the art market on multiple levels. And I'm just gonna show you a brief clip if this works, and it won't, so I'll have to go. Get out of here? All right. That's okay.
just need a quick turn. Quick turn, yeah, that's perfect. There we are. Yep. Okay, so you get a brief idea. In 1969, Ulrika Meinhof was commissioned by state television to produce a documentary drama that investigated the state-approved schools for young female delinquents in Germany. The commission resulted in the film Bambula, a word borrowed from African languages that means dance and uprising. But before the film was to be broadcast, German Television Council pulled it since it was believed that Meinhof had participated in the RAF leader Andres Bader's escape from state custody. The film was not shown on German television until 1995. Dennis Adams has divided the scene that we see here is a clip from, a 17 second clip from uh, the Meinhof film, and he divided a 17 second long sequence into 416 separate frames that comprise the sequence. He distributed them one by one in their original sequence to passers-by on the streets of Berlin. While the individual frames were being distributed, a tiny digital camera attached directly to his arm, which you can see back here, um, took close-up shots of each frame being handed over. The original 17 seconds was extended into the real-time action of handing it out into 136 minutes. The copying and the redistribution of the 17 second sequence of Meinhof's film asks us to think about a rather complex set of relations of differences to repetition, copy to cinema, cinema to the remake, the remake to history, and history to the recognition and repetition of images. What makes out te technically interesting in terms of copying is that it is a parody of a remake. Outtake literally copies the 17 seconds of Bambula Yet the pace and the performance of this film, the handing out of the film frame by frame, comments on the fact that the film is both recognizable as a film, but not recognizable as a copy of Meinhof's film, even though it enacts the copying and the distribution of her film. The film asks us to reconsider the relation of modern art to the culture of appropriation, but more importantly, it asks us to consider the image as property. How can one own an image if an image is only recognizable as an image once it has been repeated? In other words, outtake asks us to think about the semantics of what constitutes an image as an object. The artistic practice of appropriation has recently resulted in contentious copyright issues due to the increasingly more restrictive copyright legislation, which makes this art practice difficult, if not illegal. A number of law cases have emerged that investigate the division between what constitutes a transformative work that is legal from a derivative one that is illegal. As for example, the copyright infringement cases against Andy Warhol, Damien Hirst, Richard Prince, and Jeff Koons, who I'm going to talk about. Deleuze describes the work of repetition as a work of inventing vibrations, rotations, whirlings, gravitations, dances, or leaps, which directly touches the mind. It is this repetition of images, sounds, and sequences that allows us to recognize the work of art as a unique work. But what is unique is also derivative. According to Deleuze, with repetition also comes transgression. That is, repetition questions the unique work by treating it ironically, thus troubling any authorial claims to copyright. It is repetition's double articulation that challenges how we determine copyright in the case of the work of art. Now I'm going to talk just about three particular problems that 
um, the turning of an image into property causes. First, the semantics of the image or what constitutes an image. And here I want to only to point to the problematic relationship of the image to the structure set up by Pierce that, that Deleuze borrows from quite a good deal of the icon index and symbol. And just to refresh your memory, according to Pierce, an icon is a sign that shares qualities often referred to as resemblance or likeness with its referent. A symbol is based upon arbitrary conventions that define the sign as referring to the, the object it denotes. The index occupies a more complex position, dual definitions as both trace and dexis. The index functions as a trace or imprint of its object in cases such as the footprint or the bullet hole, implying a material connection between sign and object. Dexis, on the other hand, is classified as a noun denoting cognitive processes and contents, and is defined as showing, pointing, and specifying, but also is proving and displaying. Dexis is an act more than it is an object, and yet it is an image, the image of recognition, which works more as an assemblage, more like the Heideggerian thing than the object that stands in reserve, or the one that can be identified as property. <clears throat> in this sense, outtake works better in German. The cut, verschnitt, ver makes the schneiden a transitive verb, meaning that it needs an object. The question of the object in the performance is clear. Adams hands out the outtakes physically, but the recording, the repetition, or remake of the film performance challenges the status of the object of the work. Okay, the second I issue is the relation of modern art to the culture of appropriation or referentiality and the notion of the proprietary images. The culture of the copy in art has direct connections to the concept of originality and authorship and ownership. And this is probably why legal scholars are so interested in Foucault's What is an Author? Because they're interested in the relationship of signature to property. Rather than simply critique the way originality has become the measure of value in the art industry, as was epitomized by Duchamp's appropriation of found objects like the urinal, collage art of the early 20th century that integrated images in the public domain into their work, or if we think about what mashups are, are now doing. Adams is doing something different. The theft and the gift are not, in Deleuze's terms, friendly. <clears throat> to participate and discuss appropriation in the present moment means something different than it did in the 1920s and the late 1970s. This radical transformation of a long and important history of appropriation is due in part to a shift to what <clears throat> was the move from a feeling of general loss of historicity to a current sense of an excessive presence of history. To this end, Frederick Jameson concluded, the artist is left, quote, to imitate dead styles, to speak through the masks and with the voices of styles in the imaginary museum, end quote. The other part of the story is the strengthening <clears throat> and international recognition of copyright. Unlike the early instantiations of appropriation art, <clears throat> art in the age of global copyright calls attention to itself by testing the limits of permissible taking. I will show you in a couple examples here. Um, and, and two from Coons and then a couple from Sherry Levine. While Levine has never been indicted or sued for copyright in infringement, Kuhn's has been sued for copyright infringement on two more famous occasions. Kuhn was sued by the photographer um, Art Rogers in 1989 for making a three-dimensional replica of Rogers' photograph puppies, which you see up here, which Kuhn claimed as regarded, he, he claimed it was banal mass culture, and this is a quote from his uh, legal case, resting in the collective subconscious of people regardless of whether it had actually been seen by such people, end quote. The court found in favor of Rogers, determining that puppies is the product of the plaintiff's artistic creation and that Kuhn's unauthorized copy had, it, had brought monetary profit to Kuhn's without compensation to the original creator. In the eyes of the law, Kuhn's appropriation of the photograph was spoilation. <clears throat> However, in 2006, the same court of appeals and the same defense, fair use, ruled in his favor against Blanche. Um, 
So the question here is, what had changed? Peter Jazzy points out that the difference between Rogers v. Coons and Blanche v. Coons boils down to Coons' self-presentations rather than a clear understanding of what constitutes the merit of underlying works themselves. However, as Jazzy points out, this era's version of copyright law is regrettably unbalanced in favor of current copyright holders and against emergent culture of all kinds. Sherry Levine, on the other hand, has made copies of photographs after Elliot Porter, Edward Weston, and Walker Evans, drawings after William de Kooning, Schigle, Palevich, and unlike Kuhn's, Levine re-photographs, her re-photographs have been considered to be quotations, since the author is cited, even if effectively denied. In defense of her work, Levine criticizes other postmodern artists like Kuhn's, who only are invested in, quote, the context that art is placed, forgetting to see the big picture. Her work was about what she called the vibrations that resulted from recognition of the image and awareness that it has been copied. Hence, she points to the fact that there are always two pictures, the image and the recognition of the image, but there is also a third picture, the copy that gives us another image, an image of relationships, property, the public domain, authorship, dissemination, parody, copyright, the cult of the artist, the value of the work of art, the aura of an iconic image, as Benjamin might say. It is not clear why Levine's works are considered more transformative than derivative, or as Howard Singerman asks, how can we consider her work as an act of radical, that is, transgressive repetition, rather than a ubiquitous impulse to copy? Yet Deleuze does not afford repetition any morality or value <clears throat> that allows us to distinguish good from bad art. Here we have to think about this third image, the copy that becomes an object of exchange it is also an act of repetition, interruption, and violence. It is not maybe the weapon that we want to claim, but it is one <coughs> already at work. The return in the form of remediation produces only, as Deleuze argues, a difference absolutely without concept, an indifferent difference. This, of course, problematizes the concept of appropriation as having any distinguishable form the practice of returning to forms and figures of repetition ends up collapsing repetition into representation and confuses experience with aesthetics. Adam's appropriation proves that the artistic practice is always only a reappropriation, or in the case of the film, a remake. But it also involves the politics of selection. While Rogers and Blantz, as commercial artists, can sue Coons, how can we sue for works that belong to some type of cultural heritage or are in the public domain without making certain proprietary claims. So the last and the sort of conclusion is Adams um, makes us think about orphan images. And I don't mean orphan works in the legal sense. Rather, he makes us think about abandoning property because of political implications of the work or the image that are publicly disavowed, as in the case of Meinhof. No one wants to claim copyright for her work, even maybe her daughters. Hence, <clears throat> rather than deal with familiar images, outtake points directly to the disowning of images, the collective erasure of the political. It offers us a new twist in Deleuze's argument that cinema possesses the power to unthink, disassociate relations, images, and events. That is, rather than making thought into an image of thought via analogy, resemblance, or opposition, cinema can reveal the whole in appearances or make us see the figure of nothingness that makes the crisis in confidence in thought. This whole in appearances is made visible not by blank spaces or interstices between images that preoccupy Deleuze and filmmakers like Godard, but the time it takes to disseminate and recognize an image, or to put it in another way, the time it takes to appropriate an image through recognition itself. The constant juxtaposition that links and unlinks images has more to do with the non-recognition, the acceptance of the copy, rather than the familiar image. Adams points out instead to the lost context and the way the act of dissemination is transformed into the politics of semi-tertiary memory. 
That is, when the image is taken and taken out, it cannot claim to give us a new image or truth, nor can it resurrect some hidden historical reality. It suspends the very principle of reality by pointing out that these convergences of images, sounds, and text are neither authentic nor are they stable. What we are left with is a process that summons the logic of the very relationships it sets up. Thank you. Do you want to do it at the end, or we can just do it now? If there is one burning question, can okay. We? Yeah, Chris, yeah, it was really cool, a really cool talk. And, I mean, I find it interesting how you shift from one level of reading uh, distance repetition to another, where you go through from you know sort of a, a process philosophy into sort of like you know the, the, the everyday stuff of, of you know physical physical images, right? But uh, I guess what I, what I felt really interesting was the uh, the use of uh, Deleuze's thought, as you know, you pointed out about Foucault, in uh, in legal issues, because you know this, the, the way that Deleuze, Deleuze thinks is not you know cut and dry, and law is looking for cut and dry solutions. And law is not cut and dry. Yeah. And that was try what I was trying to point out with the fact <laughs> that the legal cases don't add up to any kind of precedent that's actually stable either. Coffee white is the most powerful law that we have internationally. It's most likely what you're gonna get caught for and prosecuted for. But it also, it's how you present yourself to the case. So there's something unstable in, even in, in copyright cases themselves. So I think Deleuze is quite interesting in that respect as well. Yeah. Okay, All right, thank you. So thank much. you.